Stagger and kidney stones can be some of the most challenging stones to get rid of. Not only do they come in several different stone types, but some of them can be downright dangerous if not managed correctly. Stay tuned if you or anyone you know suffers from staghorn kidney stones. Hi, I'm Joey Weichman and welcome to Stone Relief. Unlike different types of subtypes of kidney stones like calcium oxalate versus uric acid, when we're talking about staghorn kidney stones, we're referring to the shape or physical design of the stone itself. Just like the word horn in the stone in the name implies, these type of stones take on a horn-like shape that mirrors the internal shape of the kidneys, which end up looking like antlers or a piece of coral from a reef. So in today's video, we'll go over a background of this type of stone design, how they're diagnosed and what treatment options exist, and then finally, what you can do to prevent them. So to get started, let's talk about some background. Now, as I had mentioned, this is a branched style of stone. Now, it's not a specific stone type in terms of what elements go and construct it. It's just a shape that stones can take on. And it's going to look something similar to like this example I have down here in the bottle. Now, these are going to vary very greatly from person to person. It's going to be dependent upon how they crystallize in this collecting system that is your kidney. Um, so they're all going to look slightly different. They're also going to look different based on what they're made of, which we'll get into here in a second. Now, because of this kind of invasive nature in the way that these crystallize, they can actually start to branch up into the little calyxes or the pockets of the kidney, which are some of the, the functional structure of the kidney that does the processing of the urine. And it can actually impede the kidney's ability to do things. So people with stag horn type of stones generally recognize uh, a slightly elevated level of a decrease when it comes to the glomerular filtration rate or GFR rate, just because of the shape and again, the size of these particular stones. It just can spell problems for different parts of the kidney. Now, the other piece of this puzzle is that oftentimes this stone type is an infection type of stone. So this is gonna be that struvite style stone of the calcium phosphate family, which is again associated with urinary tract infections and urea splitting type of bacteria. And we have a whole host of videos on those and we'll link them up here in a card if you're curious to learn more about that. But this particular type of infectious stone is nothing to screw around with. It can be exceptionally dangerous and they can oftentimes take on the shape of this type of struvite stone providing even f higher levels of complication. Now, this infectious nature of this particular type of stone happens in anywhere between 49 to 68% of cases. So it is really, 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 really common uh, when you take a look at the overall construction of the di different uh, types of stone materials that can make up a stru I'm sorry, staghorn stone. So and that's what we're gonna talk about here. So when it comes to staghorn stones, and I'm stuttering over my S's, staghorn, struvite, uh, there's too many, but nevertheless, what it can be made from. So again, most commonly, it's going to be that infectious type of stone material, which is struvite, which is part of the calcium phosphate stone family. And this again forms because of urea splitting bacteria that is messing with your interior, like your urinary tract, which is creating an environment where these stone types actually can crystallize and cause a whole host of problems, kidney death and including death of yourself as well. So struvite stones are going to be the most common type of staghorn stone, and it's also exceptionally dangerous. So if you think you may have this type of stone or you know somebody who does, check out those other videos. Next, other types of calcium phosphate stones can also form into this shape. Just a regular old calcium phosphate stone can take on this shape. So can calcium oxalate kidney stones as well. And this is uh, both the monohydrate, which is the more dense type, and the least uh, or the less dense type, which is the dehydrate stone. Um, worked with a significant number of people who have that calcium oxalate dihydrate type of stone that forms in struvite shape to be able to naturally attack them, which we'll talk about in the treatment option section. And then they can also lastly be mixed. So you might have struvite mixed with other calcium phosphate or calcium oxalate. There's a whole host of different combinations that can come on here. But again, it's not so much about what the stone is made of, but it's more about the actual shape that these stones can take. In the next chapter, we'll talk about how these particular types of stones are diagnosed. Okay, so when we're talking about diagnosing staghorn kidney stones, this isn't necessarily anything that's gonna be any different than what you would normally do for a stone. But there are a couple things that we're gonna wanna ask and you need to be educated upon when you're talking with your urologist or maybe you're just your general practitioner about a potential kidney stone situation. So one of the first things that you're gonna to wanna to do is make sure that you're gonna get a urinalysis or a urine test. Now, typically these are like 24 hour urine tests, but the things that you're really wanting to look for in these particular tests are the following. So we're gonna be looking at urine pH. Urine pH is gonna become important here. We'll talk about it in a second. Um, 
presence of infection or bacteria. This is something that your urologist or your, your doctor should be looking for as just a default because any type of infection can be very, very problematic and even cause death uh, when it comes to kidney stones. So it's something that they should be taking an eye out for. And then lastly, just like key mineral levels. And I say minerals, but this is a whole, whole host of things. This can be things like oxalate, calcium, magnesium, presence of uric acid, citrate, those different types of things, those different elements that are measured within your urine that we would be curious to know about when we're evaluating a stone. Now, I mentioned urine pH on here because urine pH is going to become significant because urine pH is going to dictate whether or not you really have a situation for where an infection or an infectious type of stone could be problematic. Because when we're talking about struvite, which we learned about over here, which is the infectious side of staghorn kidney stones, really we're talking about stones that are forming in a urine pH that's greater than 7. And seven's being neutral. So anything that's over like 7.5 roughly, we're really talking about here. And the infectious bacteria that cause struvite stones can't form when you have a pH that's over in seven. So when you get your results back, and if you're less than seven, uh, generally you're in pretty good shape when it comes to this and no risk for a particular infectious type of staghorn stone. And then next, you're gonna be looking for some medical imaging. And this <laughs> wild, can vary wildly. Now, I typically recommend for first time kidney stone sufferers that they get a CT scan. Uh, but an X-ray or an ultrasound can also be used if you already know the type of stone that you form, you're already familiar with the density and you have all that information from previously past stones. But if you're a first time stone former, a CT scan is going to give you a lot of information. In particular, it's going to talk about density. Density is going to become something that's important when we talk about treatment options in the next chapter. But this is really just like how hard or how soft is the stone that you're forming because it can wide, uh, widely vary. Next, it's the size. So how big is it? Uh, and then where is it located is another important factor. And then lastly, hydronephrosis status. So what is that stone doing inside your kidney and then also inside of your urinary tract with your ureter as well? Is it expanding? Uh, is it expanding concerning levels? Not so much. This is generally going to be linked to the level of pain that you're feeling. So you'll be able to probably know this way ahead of time. But these are the things that we're looking for because next we're going to talk about what your treatment options are depending upon the different factors in terms of what it's made of and then also these other urinary factors too in terms of what treatment options are going to be available to you. Stay tuned. Just a reminder, this information is available in written form on our website. Find the link below in the description. All right, so now that we know background on st staghorn stones, we know they're a type of stone, we know that they come in a lot of different stone types in terms of their construction, we also know how to diagnose them what can we do to actually treat them? Now, treatment is gonna depend upon two different factors. First and foremost, and most importantly, it's gonna be based on the presence of that infection that we were talking about. So is there an infection actively present, which would be captured in the urinalysis, presence of bacteria? If it is present, dramatically different approach. However, if there's no infection, have some different options. And then next, it's the density of that stone. So again, if it's your first kidney stone, CT scan can be exceptionally valuable by getting that density information from your urologist. An x-ray won't provide it, neither will an ultrasound. However, if you've had stones in the past, you know specifically what type of stone that you're forming and you know the density that's associated with it, well, you don't necessarily need to expose yourself to the increased levels of radiation that comes with an ultrasound, I'm sorry, with a CT scan. You could use an ultrasound or you could use an x-ray to be able to get the information that we need. But if you don't have the density information, you want to try to grab it because treatment options and educating yourself on what's best for you because your urologist or the surgeon may very oftentimes make decisions on what's best for them and the urological center, your, I'm sorry, the urological center they work for versus what's best for you. So you have to educate yourself. So when it comes to these two things, so if you have an infection that's present, again, this is super serious and has to be dealt with very specifically, you're looking at a percutaneous nephrolithotomy or a PCNL. And this is where they're going to kind of cut or puncture a hole in your side and then they're going to use an access sheath to go in there and they're going to remove that stone typically with a basket uh, in several sequences to be able to make sure that that stone doesn't go anywhere else in your urinary tract and cause infection. That's why you want to use this style versus any other. Now, if you have no sign of infection whatsoever, a non-infectious type of stone, you have some more options. So for a weaker density stone, meaning this is more brittle, you could use an herbal product like our product Cleanse, or you could use something like a shockwave lithotripsy. Now, um, 
I'm hesitant always to make recommendations for different surgical things because I think overall uh, it's overused and there are some untold consequences, especially from shockwave lithotripsy, which most people just look at like it's a relatively benign or safe type of approach, but there's some long-term type of consequences that come along with using a approach like this. So it's not just, <laughs> oh, nothing. No, it actually has some serious implications that you need to consider. And that's where I just feel that if it's a weak density stone, you should be looking at some sort of an herbal formulary. Uh, it doesn't have to be our product. There are several out there that could do this, but something to attack that kidney stone. I've worked with several people over the last decade with stones of several centimeters in size. So very, very big, big staghorns, kidney stones, uh, made of several different types of materials in our product cleanse has successfully destroyed it and allowed them to pass that stone without any other type of surgical intervention. But again, you need to know the stone's density. Now, if you have a more dense stone, like a calcium oxalate monohydrate stone that has uh, evolved into a staghorn type of stone, you're really looking at a ureteroscopy for stones that are uh, probably in, located in the upper to mid pole of the kidney or uh, somewhere in that location. Whereas if there's a stone that is located in the lower pole, which is like the bottom of the bucket of the kidney, these can be a little bit more difficult to get to uh, with a ureteroscopy approach, which is going up through your urethra, through the urinary tract, and then into the kidney. Um, that can be sometimes difficult angles to work with. Whereas with a PCNL, this has the direct access benefit where it can get directly into that lower pole of the kidney to be able to break apart the stone effectively for it to be removed. Now, one caveat I do want to note here is what regardless of procedure that you, you choose, including like an herbal route, um, you know, there's going to be multiple procedures and multiple months if you're going the herbal route involved in attacking these stones. Just due to the sheer size of these stones, they're just going to take time to be either broken apart with like an herbal product like cleanse uh, or even just like breaking it apart with a laser or a ballistic mechanism that's used by PCNL or by a ureteroscopy. Sometimes it has to go back in over multiple procedures to be able to get the stone burden small enough for you to be able to pass it or for it to be removed from your body if they're using a percutaneous nephrolithotomy approach. But nevertheless, this is generally how you're going to deal with these larger stone burdens. But more importantly, which we're going to cover in the next chapter, is if you're getting these large kidney stones that are very, very complicated to remove, how do you go about preventing them? Stay tuned. All right, so welcome back to the last chapter. We're going to talk about some preventative strategies if you face staghorn type of kidney stones, which are large and very quick growing type of kidney stones. Now, just like we had talked about in the treatment section, there's some variability here based on the particular stone type that is making up your staghorn kidney stone. So again, your strategy for prevention is going to depend upon the stone type. So if you have a struvite or a calcium phosphate based staghorn stone, which are going to be the majority of them because the majority of them are struvite, uh, struvite rather, and this is that bacterial based stone. Now, what you need to do to be able to prevent this stone type is you have to fix your urine pH. These are stones are urine pH dependent. So you want to go and you want to neutralize your urine pH because if you form a calcium phosphate stone or if you form a struvite type of stone, your urine is alkaline, meaning it is greater than 7.5 on the pH scale. And you need to bring it back down into the 6.5 to 7 range, you know, right around, uh, well, 6.5 to 7.5 rather, but somehow in that 7 range of urine neutralization. And you won't form those type of kidney stones anymore, big or small. Now, if you have a calcium oxalate stone, abbreviated CAOX here, um, there are a couple different things here as well. So you need to eliminate the oxalate, which is coming from the foods that you eat, and you also need to neutralize your urine pH because the more acidic urine pH is, and it's typically what's associated with anybody who's forming a calcium oxalate kidney stone, urine pH generally tends to be acidic. This is a crystal maximizer. So the more towards like neutral urine pH of seven that you can get, the slower the stone formation is. And then when you combine this with eliminating oxalate altogether, you can effectively eliminate this particular stone type. Now, the, there are several different ways that you can go about accomplishing neutralizing urine, eliminating an oxalate, and then neutralizing urine again for calcium oxalate stones. But the best mechanism is diet, to be honest with you. So I've been doing this now for 10 years, and <laughs> I suffer from calcium oxalate dihydride kidney stones, and they're relatively large in size. I've had some that were several centimeters in size and some that were smaller, less than 10 millimeters, less than a centimeter. And 
diet has been the best mechanism. I've tried it all. I've tried the supplements. I've tried the medications from uh, my doctor. Uh, none of it had an impact in preventing my kidney stones more so than diet. In particular, an animal-based diet. I've tried all the plant-based diets, Mediterranean, vegetarian, vegan, um, you name it, o ovo lacto vegetarianism, like <laughs> all of it. The only thing that really worked for me was a carnivore diet or more recently what I've been experimenting with is an animal-based diet, which includes some ripe fruit, honey, um, and some dairy products as well. And that eating methodology not only neutralizes urine pH, but effectively it eliminates oxalate because any of the oxalates in there from this ripe fruit is negligible at best. Plants want us to eat their ripe fruit so we can deposit their seeds um, down the line <laughs> in a fertilizer that's our waste, which is a rich growth product for them. But nevertheless, pretty minimal. And if you effectively change your diet strategy, you will effectively be able to eliminate any type of stag horn stone type formation and every other type of kidney stone as well, with the exception of one, which is a cysteine stone, which is something that's completely different. So looking to stop stag horn kidney stones, fix your diet. See you in the next video. If you'd like to join a community of people learning the secrets behind putting an end to their kidney stones, visit our website.